Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much also to everyone in the audience. Um, I'll start by making myself a bit humble. Um, I had, like, due to some unforeseen challenges in the last couple of weeks, the ideas are not as clear, will not be as clear as I hoped that they would be. Um, in contrast with historical time, like with historical time as a as a, a historical or social fact, I'm rather talking about uh, like a meta perspective, uh, like it's uh, summarized by the f uh, by the phrase a "useful past," um, and I'm talking both about how Please speak up a bit. Um, yeah, I'm not close to the microphone. Yeah. Like this. <laughs> Okay. I'm having trouble hearing. Oh, sorry. Ah, it's for the recording. Yeah, but they, that's not my fault if they don't listen. <laughs> not yet. Be, I think he will manage. Okay. So anyway, it's uh, it's mo it's both about like um, contemporaneous authors tried uh, to make the uh, the past into a useful past, and also uh, I make some propositions on maybe how our own analogy analytic um, framework could be changed to reflect especially those uh, changes in hybrid forms in the early modern period. I will do that uh, on the basis of uh, some investigations into the uh, historio historiographical, biographical and topographical corpus of the Damascene scholar Muhammad ibn Tulun. And I will heed Achim Landwehr's uh, cautious statement that the central question should be how time is realized and used, not what it is. Whereas Ibn Tulun's oeuvre juxtaposes different temporal scopes and periodizations, they each responded, like that is my major uh, starting point, these, uh, tempor these periodizations and scopes all responded to specific challenges in the political or social environment, as well as to the different settings of their performance during his life. Uh, there does, no, I leave that out, sorry. It's, the start is a bit slow, it goes better after a while. Um, so a very specific context, for instance, the teaching environment or the context of literary offerings or also other literary or scholarly contexts. And the problem is, of course, that we often don't know like in which contexts uh, these works or for which context these works were conceived. Ibn Tulun was a prolific writer uh, with some 760 works and 28 fields of knowledge to his name and about 45 titles are concerned with history, historiography as I outlined it above. The majority of those are at least partly concerned with biography. And I would say that a more nuanced classification than the traditional one of chronography, biography, and prosopography is needed to make sense of the employed temporalities since Ibn Tulun frequently combines aspects of at least two or even all of those like uh, genre categories in one work. The archetypical genres of uh, chronicle biography or biographic, biographical dictionary um, should thus uh, be seen as only the fixed stars of a literary landscape, whereas the concrete works usually take a place in between this field they create together. Ottfried Weintritt has already proposed in his Arabische Geschichte, Arabische Geschichtsschreibung in den Arabischen what is this? Arabische Geschichtsschreibung in den Arabischen Provinzen des Osmanischen Reiches, uh, 16th, uh, like about the 16th to 18th century, a typology of universal, Islamic, and dynastic history. Thus, a temporal, like a temporal uh, category. Um, and by dynastic history, he means uh, history since the takeover of the Ottoman dynasty. And then he also makes the claim that there is like an, a universal category, like a global category, and then also a local variant of that. Um, with regard to Ibn Tulun, I wonder if we can, can transpose this idea of the dynastic history in particular, um, and how that relates to both the Ottoman, like either to, Ot to the Ottoman or to the Mamluk uh, Sultanate, or whether he actually tried to emphasize the continuity of these two um, states. Weintritt also argues for a biographic, uh, biographization of chronicles during the early Ottoman period 
and thereby uh, indicates the rise of hybrid forms, or maybe rather the, uh, like a supremacy of the biographical form. A certain biographization is also visible in Ibn Tulun's works, and I'm sorry that I don't have a slide for that. I, I hope you understand my uh, pronunciation of the Arabic. Um, his work, Al Arba'in Hadithan, Al Arba'in Sheikhan, Mudayala Bil Kalam, Al Al Hadith, Wa Tarajim Ashuyuch, obviously combines biography with Hadith studies. His Rayat Al Bayan, Fi Tarjamat Ashikh Al Aslan is a biography followed by a history of the Damascene Cemetery of the same name. And uh, both his biographical works on once the judges of Damascus and second the governors of Damascus are actually uh, not like uh, collections of biographies but uh, chronologically organized lists. Um, finally, his own autobiography, Al Fulk Al Mashun fi Ahwal Muhammad ibn Tulun, is not only that, but it consists also to a large part of a um, to a large part of a comprehensive list of his writings and his chronicle. Um, Mufakat al Khilan fi Hawadif al Zaman is, while it's not a biographical work in itself, defined in its temporal scope by the author's own lifetime. So, biography plays an, a very central role in this work. And I would go further than, yes, uh, I would go further than Ottfried Weintritt and actually propose that we aspire to a classification. Um, Mine is inspired by Gérard Genet's study, The Architects and Introduction, and uh, where he tries to unearth the history of European genre definitions as we have them here. Um, and I would go even further that for historiographical works of the Arabic, um, like of, of the Middle East, we uh, try to make that into a three dimensional uh, system combining mode, object, and temporality or temporal scope. But it's, as I said, this idea is still in an early age, and it's, it shines through in the rest of the talk, but it's, it's just an idea that I would also just throw out there. So in the, in the next section, I will introduce Ibn Tulun's corpus based on these categories, and then in the following section, I try to link some of the temporalities to Ibn Tulun's own time and try to show how that could have been a useful past or was seen as a possibly useful past. As I said, his historical corpus, historiographical corpus consists of roughly 45 works. Uh, these include 15 individual biographies. And again, I'm sorry, I don't have a slide of all the names of the works. 16 biographies, if we count his autobiography with them. Um, they are concerned with people from throughout Islamic history. Um, then there are several tabakat and topographical works, also not always easy to uh, distinguish from one another. Or like the problem is that we, where do we group them? That's why I proposed this. And then there is a few works that even escape these traditional genres, like if we combine them. The subjects of individual biographies, they usually have a connection to either the author or to Damascus. And uh, they usually combine biographical and topographical information. Uh, to give just one example, in a biography of Ibn al-Arabi, which is largely copied from a work by Ali ibn Maymun, um, dies uh, 1511, I think, uh, begins uh, with the Ottoman conquest and then reaches back to the biography of um, Ibn al-Arabi himself. And this is important in terms of temporality because he does that quite often, that he takes some point in history and then traces that all, all the way to his own time, which of course is not in itself like an unusual thing. Then we have uh, some collective biographies that are structured chronologically. Um, they are not always about the scholarly community. And uh, again, like the works on the judges and the governors are probably the most well known. And I would say that they are like a decidedly Mamluk history, like the work on the governor starts with the, um, with the Mongol invasion and then with the first Mamluk governor of um, Damascus. And the same is true for the chief justice. It starts with, like the, um, with the first chief justice after the Mongol invasion. <clears throat> 
But there are also other works which actually go further back. There is a work on uh, viziers, which actually just uh, tr like takes the whole scope of Islamic history. Yes. And then we have another one, the Sulk al-Juman Fima Waka'a li man li <coughs> Fima Waka Ali Min Tarajim Muluk Bani Uthman. And that is, of course, then an Ottoman history, but, and maybe this is telling, it is now lost. Um, Ibn Tulun also wrote several Tabakat works, about some of which I will say a bit more later. Again, like there's a Damascene focus, and the focus of uh, like people who he claimed were his teachers, either directly or through reading of their works. And uh, there, there is, and there, therefore, usually contemporary, like mostly contemporary history. But through the citation, he reaches also back, like further back into the history, uh, into the Islamic history. Uh, the exception is the Al Ghuraf Al Aliya fi Tarajim Mutaakhiri Al Hanafi, on which uh, Guy Burak has worked. And uh, this is a work that is concerned with Hanafis throughout Islamic history, but with a focus against, like. The, like the, most of the, the biographies start in the 13th century and go to, up to his own time. Uh, there is another work which is um, existent in a Princeton manuscript. There it's called Awan al Shuruf fi Tarajim al Ashuyuch, which doesn't appear in the work list. And again, we have an Islamic history perspective, but interestingly enough, that relies uh, to a large degree on sources like Ibn Hajar and Makrizi. Um, I'll skip some of that. What is important is that even like his, uh, even like the works that are decidedly contemporary, especially like uh, his Veil al al sorry, al al Qasr fi Tarajim al Asr, which is mostly concerned with students that studied with him, some of them still infants. Um, actually embeds itself in an Islamic, if not universal, uh, framework. And it does so uh, by citing certain passages that we also have in the Ghuraf al-Aliyah. Now we can go to the, ah, sorry. That's the wrong order. This is the one that's interesting for us. So how does, how does he do that? Um, the discourse, like the, one of the chapters in the introduction, of the Ghuraf al Aliyah, uh, and this is a chapter that is to large degrees uh, copied in his other work, and I chose this one because this is not his own, like this is not an autograph, which means that you can probably read it from here, and it means also it's available in a much better quality than like most of the uh, Cairo autographs that I work with. So what we have here is uh, like he starts with um, a discourse on dating methods and situates the uh, like the Muslim dating methods within the f like within a framework of uh, also the dating done by other people. Starts with a hadith uh, about like uh, dating done shortly after the hijra, and um, then he discusses Jewish, Christian, Samaritan, and Muslim opinions about the temporal distance between different events mentioned in the Quran and the Bible. Most often like uh, there is a reference to the Great Flood. And then he discusses the starting points of different calendars, and this is uh, what we have here on the slide. Um, and to give just some examples, the Pers he says the Persians had four eras corresponding to their four king kingdoms. Then the Greeks, they begin with Alexander's father, the Nabataeans of Iraq, and the Copts. Uh, as he says it, uh, their dating relies on old books. And then we have the pre-Islamic Arabs, uh, who used many different calendars. Um, yes, I'll leave that out. Yes, um, we have like, of course he has like one chronicle which is only like, which is like the basis for a lot of statements about his histori historiographical work, but actually is like completely contemporary to himself. Um, and then uh, we have a few works that are that fall outside of these classical genres, and I think they could be uh, they could often be just summarized as lists. And this list making is kind of an important thing in his work overall, as we see at the end of this talk. 
So there is his work Al-Luma'at al barqiyya fi Nukat at tarikhiyya which consists of 44 entries on diverse subjects from universal history um, to up to the 15th century. And they range again like from the temporal distance between different prophets uh, to a reader's digest of uh, al dhahabis writing on early Islamic history. And then we have a number of lists of disasters, of religious fitnas, of fires, and of strange births of animals and people and a number of other things. And in this category, I would also include his work, uh, Nakta Talib li Zahl al-Manasib, which uh, portrays all the different uh, positions, uh, basically, of the, of the Mamluk institutions, uh, from the uh, caliph um, and the sultan down to the different branches of the civilian and the military and the administrative sides. So. Minutes or so. Oh, I'm really slow today. Yes, I'm sorry about that. Okay. I'll just like as I said earlier, like we have the focus on the mask on the maskers, and I'll just focus on the exceptions. One of those exceptions I have already introduced. What is important here is probably also that it's not it it's not conceived of as a veil to a work by another Damascene author, but uh, to Abdel Kader Al Qurashi. And if anybody can tell me more about where he actually lived, I didn't find any information in, while I was re researching this paper. I would say that he's probably Meccan, but I'm not entirely sure, and I don't want to, I'm, yeah, it's a, it, this is a, a big issue that I had. So, um, the, other, the other exception is that Ibn Tulun claims to have, like, our works about, the, uh, about his own pedigree. Sorry about that. Um, okay, I'll skip the biographical information because I think that like uh, most people would be more or less um, familiar with that. So there's a, I have three points um, about like how we can trace that to his own, how we can uh, connect uh, his own his work to his own life and times. The first one is the reinvention of his own lineage through claims that he actually descended from Ahmad ibn Tulun, ruler of Egypt. Um, the Shukhra ibn Tulun is uncommon, and in uh, Zahawi's Daw Alami we find a considerable number of Ibn at Tulunis, but only one Ibn Tulun, and that is the one that went by here. Uh, Doris Abu Saif has studied the ascendancy of um, a dynasty of Tuluni builders during the 15th century, and she uh, speculates that the name might actually refer to the city Toulon in, in uh, France, so that they are. She's very careful about how she phrases that, but she says it's, there is a Maghrebi, like a, a definite Maghrebi origin, and it might actually be from that one. Um, then we have contemporary sources like Ibn Tauk, who writes the, uh, this name repeatedly as Ibn Tilun. And uh, then we have in Damascus at the same time also uh, Nazar al Jaish Ibn Talu. So there is, like, this is the semantic field where this name could come from. And this vagueness contrasts with Ibn Tulun's like very decided claims to ascend from Ahmad Ibn Tulun. And I would place this instance towards the end of his life, around the, uh, the time when he composed his work list, which was around 950, so around 1540. Um, he, like uh, several people, several sources mentioned that he was lacking an Ayan status, and I would say that this is the way that he claimed a different kind of nobility, putting himself even at par with the Ottoman sultans, who he claims in one of his works started out as, started out as, as Mamluks of Ahmad ibn Tulun. And uh, thus he like trumped uh, the heritage of other contenders. Have I, do I have time for one more example? Yes, and then, yeah. yeah. Okay. I just want to point out the, um, the importance of local history. Uh, in his chronicle already, Ibn Tulun mentions that the Ottomans uh, approached his teacher Abdel Kader al Noaimi to access his work, Adaris fi Tarikh al Madaris, for the land survey they, did, they were making shortly after the conquest. Uh, he rejected, but Ibn Tulun seems to have assisted them in this instance. And his Dab al Huta al Jami al Ruta, um, which is a list again of different villages of the Ruta, uh, would actually have been helpful for the Ottoman land surveys. Uh, since it resembles very much the Kitab Kawanin Adawawin um, that does uh, similar things on Egypt. 
um, what I want to say about this is that uh, there is there is definitely a turn to like local history visible in his work that I would not tie uh, to an Ottoman audience per se, but to the like contingencies of the growing like imperial framework in which Damascus was uh, situated, and that this like the uh, that this created a certain arena of competition, and that actually these uh, these uh, local histories were both meant as a source of pride for the uh, for the locals and also like to convey this pride to uh, travelers from elsewhere. So, for instance, his work on the Citadel, Citadel of Damascus um, that can even be dated to the day uh, was kind of commissioned by his friend Ja'ala ibn Fahd, who came from Mecca and who requested his work in one of his own writings. And this local history even I would say plays even a role in this work uh, Al Rodaf Al Aliya, which um, Guy Burak completely puts into a framework of like uh, center periphery. And I would say that the Ottomans are not necessarily the primary um, addressees of this work, but actually there are there are certain hints in this work. And one I want to just put on, sorry, uh, is it's this that um, that actually I see. Also, that like why he addresses uh, uh, the Ottoman question, he also addresses like uh, especially the Meccan connection that he had, and um, why I find this one this one thing important, which is uh, which just comes up in the introduction to the Rodaf, and I'm seri really seriously sorry, um, is that Jala ibn Fahd was younger than him, and he's basically the only uh, contemporary historian, or even younger historian than him, that he repeatedly cites. And there I see that like there is both cooperation and competition, and I think that some of the temporalities should be understood in this way, because you had to find a different framework than in works like that worked in a, dom in a domestic framework for arguing in this like for this local history in a trans-regional framework. Thank you very much, and um, I'm sorry that this didn't work both well.